Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Marcus. This is my partner and co-founder, Edda. Hi. We've come to you from Istanbul. And we want to talk to you about something a little bit low-tech in a world where we're talking about a lot of things that are very, very high-tech. So what we want to talk today is about rediscovering wonder in the game of life. And before I get into what the game of life actually is, but since you're leaving, I'll tell you anyway, it's backgammon. So I don't know if, if any of you who are thinking of leaving have any interest whatsoever in backgammon, I encourage you to stay. You might learn something about it that you never learned before. How does this work? I don't know. Can somebody show us how this works? Do I just click the arrow? Big green okay, button. good. Thank you. I got it. <laughs> the big one. Laser. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. So very quickly, we are approaching the future of work from a very different perspective by actually living it out in our own life. So we've gone through radical transformations from being professionals, thinking that we wanted to do that for a certain period of our life, through to starting our own companies and beyond all of that, we decided that we don't want to hire people to achieve our goals anymore. So we've created a thing called Joint Idea, which is a co-creative platform, a community, a practicing community of believers devoted to really discovering exponential humanity in the work of our life. So what we're trying to do is move away from this idea that it's your work life to actually figuring out what it is your life's work. So we have a few co-working offices. We've met a few of the people here in Istanbul that have come through our places uh, that are populated by a number of different disciplines. So we've kind of curated a family ranging from musicians to photographers to lawyers to accountants to architects to engineers to consultants to internet startups, social media companies. We currently have around uh, 40, 45 people in our, in our first home. And what's that's, what that's given us is a chance to approach our daily work life from a multitude of perspectives simply by talking to the other people in our family that are there. So if you have an interesting challenge within your own job as an accountant by talking to an artist or by talking to a musician, you might all of a sudden realize that there's maybe another way to approach problems. And if, you, if that's not even the case, at least you're with people that are of interest to you and you can kind of have different perspectives just as a way of living. And it's ultimately connecting the dots from different types of intelligences and different types of life experiences and uh, the challenges that people face every day that we might find something uh, rewarding to explore with another person. So we kind of call, call ourselves the potluck wig tribe, you know, so whoever is coming there, they're bringing something to the table, there's a talent, there's something to share, what you see is what you get, there's no masks, we try to be real human beings in the work that we're actually doing. And what's driving us more than anything is joy, you know, we're looking to find joy in our work, we want to, you know, be in a place that is resonating with the frequency that is from our heart. Uh, it's also driven by curiosity. We want to learn more about our own work, about the world, about the other people around us. And when you have them there every day, there's lots of chances to have jam sessions, not only in music, but in whatever job it is that you're actually doing. And behind all of that is, of course, hope for a better future. That's why we're all doing it, right? So with the lessons that we've learned from that over the past couple of years, we've set up a kind of lab that we've done a partnership with one of the world's leading HR companies, Audgers and Bernstein, uh, together with one of Turkey's leading private universities to create um, a lab. It's not an academy, it's not a school. Uh, it's a kind of experiment in the future of work, ultimately. So what we're trying to do is um, get into the head of the dragon. So corporations where, as you were just mentioning, people have become disengaged and unhappy and unhealthy and 90% of people within that world, 70 are disengaged but up to 90 are unhappy. So if you think of big companies actually spending and being in control of the world's money, you know, what the world looks like, where the money is flowing, it's being managed by unhappy, disengaged people for the most part. So I personally think that that's one of the biggest problems in the world. So if we can kind of go backwards and actually find ways, again, for people to find meaning and to find you know, more engagement and to get past this rat race, you know, that if, there's, if we're really creating value in our work, how do we redefine that value better? If we're living in a world where we never catch the carrot in front of us and we're living in and working in environments where the scale is just so far gone that we don't see ourselves in anymore, we can't contribute to it because it's just too big and too complex to solve, that's at the root of all of the evils of, of work that we're facing today. So how can we get down to the individual level, that people feel a sense of deeper engagement, that they can apply that into their work and 
hopefully, you know, work becomes uh, different and better and um, more productive and more engaging and, you know, for good. So at the core of this, like I said, is uh, maybe we, it's wrong to say it this way, but eliminating fake work in the office. I mean, if people are spending most of their time disengaged, unhappy, unhealthy, doing things that hopefully at some point, very soon, can be uh, outsourced to technology, we can spend, again, more of our time figuring out what real work actually is. So in whole, um, what we're focused on is business for good. And we're living at a time where belief systems are collapsing, systems are collapsing. We've lived through this in real time over the past four or five years in Istanbul, where we've lived through military coups, breakdown of the economy, terrorist bombings, you know, as a regular part of life. Um, so it's hard to believe when in a system that you see collapsing in front of you and the kind of domino effect that you see on the world stage doesn't look much better. I mean, we're not living in the perfect times these days. But where we can't rely on religion or these previous dogmas to kind of save us into the future, maybe there's a way for business to actually be this new way to align our interests and actually to create something, that business becomes a co-creative venture once again. So how do we mix talent, plurality of ideas, trust, fueled by love, self-managing systems, and how do we move that into a regenerative business model that becomes the new way of, of operating for everybody? So we've been looking for hacks and kind of, you know, things that we can do to get to this place as a regular way of working and living. And surprisingly, um, one of the things is backgammon, actually. For us. <laughs> for us. <laughs> and, you know, this is a message that we're very, very happy to be sharing with you here today. How many of you here have anything to do with backgammon? You play it, you love it. Good. Well, that's uh, more than most times, actually, so it's good. In Turkey, it's actually a game that people are born with. It's in their blood, and this is generally the way that it is in the Middle East, actually. And why is that? It's the world's oldest game. So we live in a place where we are living in the cradle of civilization, so it's not a surprise that this game you know, is kicking around in everybody's closet. But after, um, I, I'm a newcomer to the game, by the way, so I've played for the past four years only. I bought my first... Um, Religiously done. <laughs> Well, I'm making up for lost time, that's for sure. I probably have played, you know, four or five thousand games in the course of that four years, but it's become almost a way to, to build a mantra, to understand somebody, to get beyond the surface, actually. We'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. You know, it's called by many different names in different countries, but the bottom line is there's no real recorded history. People have just been playing it, and I actually think that these guys are the ones that maybe invented it, that you see right here. So if you go that, back that far. So even previous to human beings actually having any recorded history of this, if you now go to many of the world's oldest archaeological dig sites, Göbekli Tepe, I don't know if you have, or Hassan Cave, or any of these places that are you know, 20,000 years old, they're finding backgammon games, or things that look very much like backgammon. So it's been around forever. Um, in English literature, there's only about 150 books in history that have been written on backgammon, which I find amazing for the world's oldest game. But it turns out that the guy that wrote the book uh, called Backgammon actually was uh, an exile from the Russian Romanov family, living in Istanbul, not far from our office. And uh, in the 1970s, wrote this book, learning how to play backgammon from the streets of Istanbul, basically. So he held the first backgammon world championship in the 1970s and founded the International Backgammon Society. <clears throat> when you go a little bit farther east into history, uh, there's no satisfaction coming from the West, let's say, in terms of living records, but a great story that we found um, is that going back to around 1600s, 1500s, uh, the Indian and Persian emperors used to be great foes uh, when they were at war, but when they were at peace, they were both great gamesmen, actually. So the king of India sent uh, a chess game to the king of Persia with an inscription without any kind of um, discussion of how to actually play. He said, who thinks more, who knows more, whoever sees farther ahead, it is he who wins. So, of course, the Persian emperor was, you know, intrigued by this, and he got his best vizier to study this game and to figure it out. And over the course of a couple of years, they learned how to play it, and he said, make me a better game. Uh, so, he, his response was, yes, it is he who thinks more, he who knows more, and he who sees further ahead may also win. But there's a thing called luck, and that's life. And this luck was introduced into the game through dice, basically. No. So, within this game, I don't know if some of you have play, but perhaps this is an interesting story for you. So the design of the game from Vizir Buzur Mehir, around 600 AD, 
um, was that the game, in fact, has it's a, it's a time capsule, number one. So you open it up, and it's meant to represent one year. How does one year come out of this game? You have four corners, each representing one season. You have 30 pieces in total, which represent 30 days of the month, half of which are black, half of which are white. So there's a balance built into that. You have 24 pieces or points on the board, each of which represents an hour of the day, half of which generally are black, half of which are white. So again, it's a day coming into the story there. And a few liberal interpretations that we've discovered ourselves along the way is that the black and white also represent male and female or masculine and feminine forces, so gender duality, and, yes. and some kind of duality. We're going to come into that. And the dice, the maximum any individual can roll is 12. So you're playing with two people, so you have a maximum, again, of 24. So how your day actually gets spent, according to the dice, is really the luck of the game. So there's an interesting kind of metaphor built into that. If you take it a few levels further, it's simply an illusion, very much like the systems that we're living in around us, actually. So you can draw back I mean, in the sand, you can play with buttons, you can draw it out on a board. It's simply a mental framework. So by seeing that, again, it's a kind of hack for understanding our life a little bit better and the world that we're living in a bit better as well, which is built on these ideas of duality. And these are kind of constant issues that we're coming up with here also in this conference. So I mean, when we look at the future, if there's always a winner and always a loser, you know, that creates a, a kind of deadlock of some kind. And when I became um, close to Edna and his partners, we've been in this kind of world of backgammon for two years, is a kind of religious practice. Every, Every day, day we play <laughs> <laughs> on taxis, boats, planes, no matter where. Well, there's always a backgammon with us, basically. And I think that, you know, if you want to just comment a little bit about it on the importance of words and duality in terms of your views yes. on that, it would be great to hear that. Like you said, Tavla is one of the oldest games, and I'm Turkish, so my fun family, my father, that's always been a game in my life. But in Turkey, Tavla is basically like rest of the games in conventional world we have learned. It's about winning and losing. It doesn't matter how much fun you have out of the game, but it is if you win, you're a winner. If you lose, you're a loser. And just like everything, it's based on duality. So if we think out of the box and then realize that there is no winning or losing, but like all the books say, like enjoying the journey and getting to know the other in front of you and engaging in a different form. That's a wonderful way of communicating. That's how we use Tavla as a tool in our lives or a hack into our life, basically, to think out of the box, to become an observer. Sometimes when you're playing and caught up in the game, just like in life, you are caught up in it and you don't see other moves. You're just focusing on winning and or not losing. But if you become an observer, just like human beings, sometimes we need to become an observer to see our life in a broader perspective, to understand what's happening and why it's happening. So that's also a tool to understand that. And from the make the mind loser to a manifester where you create a new connection, you create a new communication with the other. Can we go? Perfect. <clears throat> and part of the anxiety that we're, or part of the world that we're living through these days is one of anxiety. We can't sense the future. We know that it's coming, but we don't know really what it feels like. So issues of resilience are, you know, important. So, I mean, how to keep up your stamina in a game when you're losing. In the course of playing these thousands of games that we're playing, we've come across many European champions and others who are kind of also... Uh, you know, it takes you over. It's an addictive game, let's say, at the end of the day. Not from the perspective of winning or losing, but just the fascination of flow within the game. And at a certain point, you know, everybody's technical skills are the same. But what separates a winner from a loser, ultimately, is attitude. So 90% of gameplay at the highest level, whether this is in European or national or international championships, it's about resilience. It's about keeping your mental headspace despite all the pressure around you. Because somehow, when you lose your mojo or your energy, like in life, you start losing. So whether the dice intuit this or how it happens, we have no idea, but it's an important hack and lesson for our lives as we live through anxious times. So it's not about how you fall, it's about how fast you get up and keep your, your stamina. Yes, and it's as the rules that is passed down from generation to generation, like you guys were mentioning, all these business terms or life, every term that we have accepted so far, it's time to question and unlearn and possibly create new meanings to the words that we've been using. So it makes us wonder what message are we passing on to, from generations this game passed on a message win. If you don't win, like my father told me the other day, I said, I don't care if I lose. I just, it's just communication and connecting and enjoying it. And he's like, no, you know, you should be winning because that generation, that world that was creating was about that. 
Yes, we should meet win, but with a more engaged way, where it's a win-win situation, not only winning one side, but, but both sides are engaged. Yeah, so what's beyond winning? I mean, if we look at even spiritual teachings and going to the Heart Sutra and different places, you know, the kind of great unknown. Maybe there's nothing there, but it doesn't have to only be about the winning and the losing. So to kind of be comfortable with the unknown, with the idea that there may be nothing beyond that, is a lesson that you can really pull from the game as well. And the issue of human-to-human -human connection is really what also the future of work needs to be about. So when you're playing backgammon with somebody, there's a chance to express yourself with various dicing styles, you, the idea of eye gazing and eye contact, the exchange of oxytocin, you know, somebody that's sitting across from you, possibly sweating, you know, that starts to bring people quite a bit closer together. So it's a kind of deep dive into humanity that if it could be integrated into the workplace, you know, bringing a little bit of that feeling into, uh, it's an activity, it's an excuse, really, you know, to kind of engage deeply with people. And to kind of move your dicing style beyond the math, you know, that there's, you know, fixed moves for everything, explore that a little bit, you know, it's an exploration into adaptive thinking. This is what we need to do in the world that we're facing. We need to try new combinations. We don't always know best. You know, sometimes throwing a few risks out there can take you, um, farther than you would expect. And it's a chance also to engage in the other person's mindset and psyche as well, which was a kind of lesson from the pre one of the previous sessions. You like to explain <laughs> that. <laughs> you love it. The, <laughs> like I was saying, tafla is something that we take with us everywhere. So it's, it's a way to kind of live in the flow. And once you understand what flow feels like in anything that you're doing, I mean, you can somehow pull that and take it to even mundane tasks that you might not enjoy working on so much. So it's just, again, again a kind of way to fine-tune frequencies. And, um, you know, you'll never be alone if you've got a tabla with you. Let's put it this way. It's always an excuse to meet a stranger anywhere. And that meeting a stranger and sitting in front of the stranger, actually with Tur Tavla, you can have a character assessment. How they handle losing, how they handle winning, how did they present themselves, or what are the words they use. Those are a way for you to understand how authentic that being is, how maskless it is. And in some way, if you're going to do business, do I want to be sitting at the table with this person and do business? Is this person aligned with me? That's a wonderful way to see the ego, the masks, could you do business together, like she, he said. So it's a way of understanding the other. And it's not a lie. When we actually are, we don't generally don't try to hire people. We're trying to make a human, you know, human venture platform, let's say. But with very few exceptions, we play a tabla with everybody that we deal with. So it's very important to see how people behave under pressure, how their ego comes out, how their masks come out. And with our partner, who is an HR world expert, they have their own assessment methodologies. We're working with neuroscientists to develop new assessment methodologies. But I believe that Tavla is one of the best ones from <laughs> that perspective because it brings out something that you can't fake. You know, if you're, if you're fluent in the game, you can't hide your character. So really, um, it's a message from the past to the future. So if we're thinking of how to actually create a better future, it's not going to happen through things we've memorized. It's not going to happen through pro formas. It's not going to happen through the mechanics of the whole thing. It's going to actually happen by us finding more, live, more ways to live more artfully and deeply and meaningfully. And in life, you can only truly win if you have imagination and guts to really play, to really be alive and to force life and to find something from it, the kernel of wisdom, the reason for living. So. so it's a game that is best to play when you engage with your opponent as a collaborator rather than within the company's employee and employer kind of a thing, that all from hierarchy to you know, networking kind of, where you are collaborating with the other. And it's from duality, like I said, to a win-win situation. So we'll be around and um, and the tavla is here. If you guys want to engage with us and have a chat over a tavla, we would really love that. And I'm so obsessive about this that I've now made seven playlists on Spotify called Tavla Ben. <laughs> um, so please look them up. I only have eight followers so far, and after this conference, I would love to have at least double that. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you.